My name is Lorcan Butler and I'm an optometrist with the Brain Tumor Charity. My presentation is called The Differential Diagnosis Between Papilledema and Pseudopapilledema with OCT and Non-OCT. So 90% of people with papilledema will tend to be symptomatic, 90% will be female, 90% will be obese, 90% will come from a low socioeconomic background. Papilledema is a condition where the optic nerve is swollen and it's usually in the presence of elevated intracranial pressure which has been measured by lumbar puncture. It can be a sight-threatening and life-threatening condition and it affects both children and adults. Pseudopapilledema is where the optic nerve appears to be swollen but it's actually not. So it just tends to be a physiological variation and usually it's congenital, people are born with it and there's usually three or four different variants but they do tend to cause us to raise our ears up and think could this be papilledema? The majority of people with Papilledema will be symptomatic. They tend to come from a very specific phenotype. They tend to be young females, higher than average BMI of a specific age. And they'll tend to present with symptoms which are very specific to headaches, waking up in the morning time, sometimes um, feeling uh, a, a nauseous sensation, uh, becoming progressive, sharp, intense pain. Pseudopapilledema don't tend to have the kind of typical presentation. They can sometimes present with visual disturbances, headaches, but not as much as people with the real papilledema. Trying to put all your imaging together so you may not have autofluorescence but you do have OCT, you've got visual fields and you have the colour fundus photography. So by adding all of these together it does tend to make it easier for you to make that decision shall I refer, should I not refer, is this a papilledema, is it a pseudopapilledema. With OCT you can actually very very, very easy differentiate if it is a papilledema or a pseudopapilledema. So we're looking for four or five specific characteristics. We're looking at the overall volume of the optic nerve head, we're looking at the peripapillary retinal nerve fibre layer, that's going to be thicker than normal. We're also looking at the cup to disc, so what tends to happen with a papilledema is the optical glaucoma, so the cup to disc ratio in a glaucoma increases progressively with a papilledema it goes the opposite, it decreases as it gets filled with axoplasmic debris and exudates. We'll also look at forward bowing of Brooks membrane. This is two papilledema, one on the left hand side which is more advanced, one on the right hand side which is mild to moderate. We're talking about this area down here, okay, so this is Brooks membrane and in theory Brooks membrane should be quite straight, okay, or sometimes it can have a slightly downward angulation, that's normal. When it tends to go upwards that's not normal and that's referred to as a forward bowing of Brooks membrane. So this is a classical example of a forward bowing, okay? So this is referred to as a subretinal hyperreflective space. This is edema. This is the bottom of the optic nerve here. Pressure is coming from here. This is the subarachnoid space. It's contiguous with the subarachnoid space in our brain. Intracranial pressure is pushing upwards. So Brooks membrane goes upwards, okay? So that's forward bowing. Okay, happens in two thirds of people with papilledema, one third it doesn't actually change. And the more important one which is used a lot now by ophthalmologists is the macular ganglion cell complex layer and this has been used now as a precursor to visual fields and glaucoma and also with neurodegenerative conditions like Alzheimer's dementia. It does tend to be an area where you can pick up signs an awful lot better. And the very last one which sometimes people aren't aware of is retinal folds, papillary folds, retinal creases and these would tend to be seen only in a papilledema, never seen in a pseudopapilledema. So what tends to happen is the optic nerve becomes bigger, it becomes swollen so it's a biomechanical stress the surrounding retina has got a stretch to accommodate that and therefore we get these folds or wrinkles or creases. These are the peripapillary wrinkles. Can everybody see them? Which side are they on? Nasal, temporal? Why are they temporal? Because the pressure is coming from here. Okay, so the nasal margin becomes elevated and it pushes the pressure over onto the temporal side. Okay, so you'll see this retinal area shows the wrinkling. Okay, the biomechanical stress. So if you don't have an OCT, just test the nerve. If there's nerve function, that's very reassuring. If there's nerve dysfunction, which all optometrists are able to do, that would be a concern. So we need to check for colour vision. Okay, so if colour vision is affected, that would be an aid to saying there could be something wrong. We also need to do a check on the pupils and checking for RAPD, and that's an optic nerve function. And the third test we need to do is a visual field test. So that's what we refer to as testing the nerve. If there's nerve dysfunction, you'll probably have an anomalous result in one or all three of those tests. If we don't have any issues with those three tests, then we can say the optic nerve is functioning well. Therefore, it may not be papilledema. The colour vision finding for females would be normal, but usually kind of with people who do have papilledema, you'd find a monocular colour vision defect. So it's a kind of case of just finding any colour vision test. You don't necessarily need to know sensitivity or specificity, and then record each eye in turn to get a monocular recording. And it's very good for assessment, but it's also good for follow-up too as well, to see if the conditioning is remaining stable or becoming worse.
How do you ask them? Do they have transient visual obscurations? I want to ask you a simple question about your vision. Does it ever disappear? And this is the number one characteristic for children. So we're talking about adults and children. So for children who present with papilledema, their number one concern is transient visual obscurations, a darkening of the vision. So if you have a child who comes in and the parent is concerned, ask the child, does your vision ever disappear? And also do visual fields. So approximately 50% of kids with papilledema do have visual field defects. So what symptoms will they give you? Okay, so one thing they'll talk about is headaches. What type of headaches will we anticipate somebody with papilledema to have? Sharp, intense, acute, painful, sore, throbbing, really, really bad. The quality of life is very, very poor for some of them because they have debilitating headaches. And sometimes they take medication, over-the-counter medication, that tends to aid the, for a part-time. But usually these, these headaches tend to be chronic, they tend to be progressive. So they'll either be very, very acute and sharp and intense, or else they'll be long-standing progressive, which are becoming consistently worse, increasing in frequency, increasing in severity, increasing in duration. Waking up in the morning time with a headache is very, very difficult, okay? Sometimes feeling you want to get vomited, you want to get sick too as well. They'll talk about something called a pulsatile tinnitus, which is a whooshing noise they'll hear in their ear. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Sometimes it can be very acute, sometimes it can be intense, but the majority of people would tend to be more progressive. That's getting worse, that's getting harder. And it's worse when they're lying down. So when they're lying down or they're back in the morning time, they wake up and sometimes it's the headache that wakes them up because it's so severe. And the reason why it's so severe is because the cerebrospinal fluid can't drain, the intracranial pressure increases and the headache intensifies. And then as they stand up and move around, the cerebrospinal fluid can drain, the ICP decreases and the headache tends to get better. Now that can be very easy for an adult to describe, but imagine a pre-vocal child, they wouldn't be able to describe that to you. So sometimes a parent saying, looking at my child holding their head in their hands, being cranky, crying in the morning time, those would be exciting to be looking for with children. So this would be the visual field of a mild, moderate and severe papilledema. So in the mild stage, we have the enlargement of the blind spot. In the moderate stage, we have the enlarged of the blind spot plus the inferior defect. And you can see here, it does tend to have an inferior quadrantopic defect nasally, respecting the horizontal midline. And you can see it looks like a nasal step in a glaucoma. Okay, so you'll tend to find that's a clue. So respecting the horizontal midline. If we intervene at this stage, the prognosis is quite good, that the visual fields will normalize. If we wait to this stage, the prognosis doesn't tend to be as good, okay? People always ask me, which is the first part of the optic nerve to come swollen, first of all, and it's usually nasally. So it usually goes nasal, superior, inferior, superior, nasal. It's never, ever temporal. So if you ever see an optic nerve head which is slightly swollen, temporally and think that's papilledema, it's not. The temporal area is always the last area to become affected. So we have college guidelines for the college optometrist. It is an urgent referral, which means it needs to be seen to that day. We need to refer to ophthalmology, casualty, accident and emergency, and we have a duty of care to look after a patient to the best of the ability. And that needs to be done that day. We'd always refer to accident and emergency casualty ophthalmologist okay so we stay in our own lane we'd never refer to neurology we'd never refer to neuroophthalmology the reason being if you put down a referral for a neuroophthalmologist the ophthalmologist is going to come in and say oh that's the neuroophthalmologist that's for Barry I'll leave it on Barry's desk Barry is away on holidays for two weeks you've cornered yourself by limiting your choices in terms of the management, the management tends to be usually weight loss, which can be very, very difficult. A lot of these females tend to have, I uh, said, 90% of BMI and weight loss can be very difficult for them. So we need to have weight loss, first of all. If that's not suitable, then there's weight loss and medication. And that can sometimes work, sometimes it can't work. And then if that doesn't work, then there's weight loss medication and surgical intervention just to relieve the pressure, the intracranial pressure. The Brain Tumor Charity is the largest charity in the world dedicated for people who've got brain tumors. So it's not just necessarily the patient themselves, but also the family members. So maybe your mom, a dad, a brother, a sister, a daughter, a son uh, who does have a brain tumor. And we tend to give guidance and we signpost people to different resources and we tend to act as a, a support unit too as well. A lot of the money we tend to raise comes from fundraising, so we do a lot of sporting events too as well. We sponsor a lot of places, London Marathon. We tend to have wonderful young ambassador programs, so for people who have been affected by a brain tumour, either directly or indirectly, 18 to 25, they tend to champion our cause and spread our message across the community, as I try to do as well.
Within the optometry community is just raising awareness. So a lot of optometrists don't have the connection between eyes and brain tumors. So approximately a third of people with a brain tumor do have actually visual problems. And that can be at the beginning of the journey. So they go to an optometrist because they've got blurry vision or double vision. It can also be secondary to the treatment. So the treatment can sometimes be just observe, watch and wait. They don't want to do any treatment. It could be uh, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and that can have an effect on the eyes and the visual system. And sometimes people lose their vision because of the brain tumor and that can have a difficulty so they aren't able to drive, for example. And then we as optometrists have to be able to guide them and point them in the right direction. And that's where we as a charity tend to raise awareness and help optometrists understand the importance of eyes and brain tumours.